two rather special features about this outbreak. First of all, it was killing 50% of people who got infected. They have respiratory symptoms, just like flu, coughing and, and, and tightness across the chest, pneumonias, and they were dying. About half of them would, 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 would die. And then, then had this, they had this heliotrope coloration, lavender coloration of the face, which denoted lack of oxygen. So, and then they did the pathology. This is in the middle of the First World War. They did the pathology, and they found a very strange pathology of deep-seated infection in the lungs, whereas the, where the air sacs should, be, had, should have air in them, but in these people they had fluid in them. And also the bronchi, the small air tubes, were being blocked um, by, by coagulated material, perhaps bacteria. Anyway, clogged up. Yeah. One way or another, you were running short of oxygen, and that's, why, that's how they died more. Organ and failure. This was the, the, the pus that the, the yes. they found? Yeah. Yes, and that's why they called it, uh, uh, that was called epidemic bronchitis. It did seem to affect the bronchi as well as the lungs. Um, so it seemed to us that that could be an early outbreak of flu because they couldn't understand those authors and they were a very high-powered group. Mm -hmm. They were a high-powered group of doctors, physicians, pathologists, and bacteriologists, morticians. Um, and uh, by the way, the, it, it was then soon apparent that, to me anyway, and I didn't know before, that the British Army had stripped out more or less half the total medical infrastructure in Britain mm -hmm. and transported it to the Western Front. So they'd set up 85 hospitals detailed hospitals and their associated laboratories on, on the Western Front. So here, within 10 miles of the fighting, um, there were laboratories, animal houses, uh, dissection places, just like being at the London Hospital. <laughs> the only thing is, they were able to cope with all that. They, they set up all these hospitals on the Western Front. They could cope with, just about cope, with a thousand wounded soldiers coming in a day, whereas my hospital the Royal London Hospital, one of the biggest teaching hospitals in Britain, with 500 beds, we can't cope with 40 people coming in. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's that, the that's thing to appreciate. The so the, the, the thing, war overwhelms everything. Yeah. But their task, when they were set up in 1915, was to look for disease that might enter the British Army. Could it be typhoid, cholera, smallpox, typhus? Um, that was about the limit they made. Identify organisms, the cause, and make a vaccine. That was their remit. Right. One of the pathologists there was Alexander Fleming, oh. who later discovered penicillin. So I, I sometimes think his discovery of penicillin was mixed up. It, these things don't just come out of the blue. Yeah. was mixed up with his pathology in the First World War. He was working at Bologna, one of those big, big, big places. Uh, and they were trying to work out what the cause of this infection early was, 1916, 17, and then by 1918 they were also trying to work out what was what was going on from the infection, and they picked up a number of bacteria: Streptococcus, Staphylococcus, Pneumococcus. They couldn't pick up a virus, although they were looking for one, and a bunch of them actually got together and started to do filtration experiments to see if they were dealing with a virus rather than the bacteria, and 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 he died. The, the lead. Gibson in that group died of the infection. So these pathologists and doctors were risking their lives yeah. in every kind of way. And when we talk about people, uh, soldiers risking their lives, it probably uh, being in, in a laboratory or being in a, in a tent where people were dying of these infections, you, you were putting yourself more at risk um, than if you were sitting in a trench. But they didn't know how big this was going to be and they didn't know what they, were, what they were thinking. So that's one bunch of my students came up with this. Uh, the other bunch um, started to look more at the virus, a potential virus. By this time, of course, we, we knew what we were potentially what we were dealing with. And so one was going on, on the history of it, and the other was going on, how could we deal with these samples? Unbeknown to us, a much more high-powered group Jeffrey Tobenberg's group was doing the same thing. And yeah, I remember what, I remember the year I opened up the journal Science, I think it was. And I, who, who on earth is this character Tobenberg, and why has he done the work that we want to do? And so, sitting by himself in the Armed Forces Institute, with a remit to make the institute famous, um, he'd asked for samples from 1918 and got them instantly on his desk. He didn't have to send students hunting around in the bowels of the hospital. Right. And, and then sat on it and year by year, with a very small team, 
chundled through and tried to get extracts and tried to get genes and all that stuff and did it. Yeah. A huge effort and did it. And so we've worked with him since. But he was the person who, who blew the world apart, blew the world of virology apart by coming out with the first backbone. I always appreciate that, I really do. <laughs> and um, so there we had it. We had suddenly, all of us then knew that we could grasp the 1918 virus. Right. We could hold it in our hands and we could look at the genetic information and it would tell us instantly why this virus killed 50 million people or maybe 100 million people. It would all be there in front of us. But it soon became apparent that, that was not the case. We had the genomic information about the virus in front of us, but that didn't say all that much. And then the group in the United States um, at the Center for Disease Control, where I was last week actually, um, they recreated the virus from the genes and they were able to handle it. But I know we're all in dispute about it, but I don't think that tells us all that much either because it does not tell us, it doesn't tell me that that virus that they've created, uh, that they've got, um, is, any much, is much more virulent than any other flu virus. So there we are, we've got, we've got our hands on it, um, groups around the world, but it does not, the answer is not crisp. Maybe we're silly to think it would be. Right. Uh, so you could say, I sometimes think there are 50 million people dead out there and they're asking us what happened. Yeah. We're the next generation or the generation but one coming from that time. You know what's what, what tell us. You tell us. <laughs> and sometimes when we do exhumations, we have done ex several exhumations of people who died and their relatives are given permission to have them exhumed. They often, the relatives, they, 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 that's what they say. They say, we're not satisfied with a death certificate that said my, my uncle died of pneumonia or something like that, or even my uncle died of influenza. We want to know the nuts and bolts. How? How? Was there anything special about that virus? How did it get to where it got, and when it got there, precisely how did that virus act to send my, rela my relation, relation temperature soaring, this breathing halting, how, how, how can, you explain that, you explain it to me. And so on that basis, they will agree, and they have agreed, relatives to have their, have their uh, relatives exhumed, which is not a small thing to agree to. So you can see that the society is running along, all right, um, and lots of people are now working on the 1918 virus. But when you come down to the great questions of where it came from, I mean, it didn't come from outer space, where did it come from? Yeah. Um, how did it kill? Uh, why did it kill young people rather than an elderly, an elderly group? Uh, and where is it all going to go next? And what are we going to do about it? There are the great unanswered questions. Oh, and right. here we are sitting 100 years later trying to answer them. Yes. If you could, if you could just use it to just... Yeah, well, if you like, here's, here's the beast. I mean, in reality, uh, the, here's a single virus. In reality, 20,000 of these could sit on the sharp end of a pin. Right. So they're very, they are pretty small. Um, but this is the structure opened up by electron microscopy and by molecular biology. And when Jeffrey Tobenberger um, did his hoiking out influenza genes from a piece of lung tissue, and when we do the same, what we're getting is those. So the structure is out of a football. Uh, inside is a genetic information in the form of RNA, mm -hmm. not DNA, but RNA. And that's protected by several layers of proteins. One's called the matrix, and then there's a layer of lipid. And protruding through this football structure, there are two spikes of proteins. One is like a, like a, knob, a Toblerone yeah. chocolate, a three-corner thing. That's the hemagglutinin. And there's another one, a, spike, a, a mushroom thing, and that's called the neuraminidase. Now, 1918, we now know, we didn't then, but we were, we, it was hinted then by... Um, retrospective epidemiological studies um, that the virus was H, H1N1 um, and that, that's how we, we, we call it. So if you, if you recreate, if you, push, if you pull out the gene which codes, and there are eight genes here, mm -hmm. each gene codes for one of the proteins. So if you 
if you hoik out the influence of the gene coding for the for the hemagglutinin, that's the H1, you can hoik out the H1 gene, you can hoik out the, pull out the NA, N1 gene, another one here, and you pull out the genes for all the little bits and pieces. And, what, and that's been done. And so what you do, you can also do, is recreate the whole virus by pulling out all the genes and yeah. using what's called reverse genetics. So that's, that's the nature of the beast, the physical structure of the beast, uh, which, which killed 50, maybe 100 million people. No, not yet, okay. not yet. So you, if, you, if you recover all of these eight genes and, and reassort them and mix them in with other influenza genes, compare the, the, re, the resurrected virus, which you have to do under a high category of safety, mm -hmm. uh, with other influenza viruses. It does not, to me anyway, it does not hit you in the face. It doesn't give you a smack across the face. I've never been astounded by any of this data saying, well, that's the answer. That's why 50 million people died. So it's still not very clear, I don't think. And that, well, that leads us to the lack of clarity of the gene structure. But I mean, after all, uh, you, you know, with a human genome, we all thought you work on the human genome, it'll be there in front of us, and all <laughs> nature, all our special characters we hidden will be there in the, our genome and they'll better give us answers, but so far it's not been the case. I'm sure it will be in the end when it all mounts up and not in the middle. So it's certainly not with a small thing like this, even just with eight genes. So the consensus I think at the moment, and that's a consensus I go for, is that a number of reasons why 50, 60 million people died. One is that the virus may have been pretty unique um, in the sense that people have not seen it before. And that, that helps a virus get cracking if there's no immunity to it. Or possibly, a subgroup in the population had seen it before, a few years before, a few years before, and they had memory. Could in the preceding pandemic before 1918 was in 1889. Yeah. So it's just possible, and, and, and more than possible actually, that if you'd gone through that Russian pandemic, mm -hmm. uh, and, and that, was, that was the first one to hit you mm -hmm. as a little child, mm -hmm. that's 1889-90, so by the time you came to 1918, you were 28 years old. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and you had a kind of an imprint um, of that virus, that Russian one, in you. And it was totally unrelated, the Russian one, to 1918 one. And that total unrelationship could have made you vulnerable. Let's, let's put it that yeah. way. Let's put that way. They're getting into the complications yeah. of original <laughs> antigenic sin and these other things. So yes, the previous, your previous history would have an effect. Well, let's give another example. If you were a 60 year old in 1918, mm -hmm. that would have put you back into what, the 1860s, into the 1860s. Mm -hmm. And there would have been a flu virus circulating then, uh, but it was, and it could have been H, H1N1, like the 1918 one, or a variety of H1N1. So it is possible they recycle and come back again. So a 60 year old born in 1840, they may, their may, first infection could have been with an H1N1, which then vanished, was replaced with another pandemic strain in 1889, which then vanished and was replaced with another one in 1918, but the older people would have immunity to it. Yeah. And so they, they wouldn't die in 1918, and they did not die in 1918. So, so immunity, your previous history, um, a bit of extra virulence maybe with the virus, mm -hmm. it's novelty, um, and the fact that, um, it, it, it came into a particular age group, a youth age group, in, ex, in, in, in excessively came into that group. And young people have a great immune system, a great immune system. When you're 25, 26, your immune system's at its peak. Yeah. It's just like if you're a sports person, yeah. everything is at its peak at that age. And so it is possible that you, you got infected with this virus, which has some, you know, some unique, unique characteristics, a bit of your immune past, and suddenly your immune system just goes berserk. This is the storm idea. And gives you a cytokine, what's called a cytokine storm, yeah. and more or less you kill yourself. Right. There are other examples in virology where that happens, and the classic one is hepatitis B. Hepatitis B is an, immune rea an autoimmune reaction, if you like, an immune reaction to the virus that, that begins to kill you or make you, it makes you ill, not just the virus by itself. Yeah. So this is so odd because uh, um, my understanding of, of, of viruses is, is, you know, they don't, 
They don't want to kill you. They, the, 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 the virus itself needs to, to keep you alive so it can go on and pass on and thrive. And yeah, but if you're, if you're dealing, you see, most viruses, they, they, they are themselves and they don't change. Yeah. They've only got one chance, if you yeah. put it that way. Yeah. You know, get hep B, you're never get, going to get infected again with hep B because you're lifelong immunity and so on. Polio, lifelong immunity. But influenza has the ability to change. Yeah. All, and it's, it's different from many other viruses in the sense of RNA is very... The, the enzyme which transcribes RNA to, a, to, a neg to another strand of RNA, it, the enzyme is very low fidel fidelity. Mm. It's a low fidelity enzyme and errors, mutations accumulate. So influenza exists as a bunch of mutants. It's not pure, the virus. It, exists, it comes at you a whole bunch of little influenza viruses, they all look the same, yeah. but they all got very slight different characteristics. There will be some, as you get infected, there will be some viruses, influenza that infects you, which have mutation, which are, which are resistant to drugs but have not yet been discovered. <laughs> of course. So you, you can see, you see the extent of it. And if you then discover a drug, that, then that virus would have an advantage. That sub-little clone would have an advantage could come out. It's, it's all to do with Darwin. So. So the difference end of influenza from any other virus, really on, on this planet, is it is continually changing um, every year, and even more than that, it's re-emerging from its animal reservoir, from its bird reservoir. So we're at, it has two faces, influenza, the pandemic face, infrequent, massive, and the epidemic face, year by year grinding away. No other virus is like that. Yes, in the 1889 outbreak that you mentioned, yeah. um, a disciple, a student of Robert Koch. Now, Robert Koch was the famous bacteriologist mm -hmm. in the world at the Robert Koch Institute, as now is in Berlin. And there were Louis, the other famous bacteriologist was Louis Pasteur mm -hmm. in France. Uh, uh, they had a student, um, uh, Robert Koch had a student, uh, who investigated the 1889 outbreak. And he isolated what's called a gram-negative bacillus mm -hmm. from it. It was a very small bacterium. Uh, it was very difficult to isolate and very difficult to handle. Um, and it, the, the doctor's name was Pfeiffer. And everyone called it Pfeiffer's Bacillus, mm. whether they believed it or not. And most people believed it because he came from a, a stable of, uh, of, of race, race bacteriologists who were like, you know, it's like pedigree. The pedigree yes. was fantastic. The thoroughbred. So, yes, so Pfeiffer was a thoroughbred bacteriologist. Yeah. Um, and you, you, there's something to be learnt from that because it, he, he wrote all this up, not a very good paper, and published it a single page. Now, it, it would not be swallowed these days, but because he was a disciple of Robert Hawke, it was swallowed. Um, so that's the danger sometimes of just swallowing something entirety um, from a high expert. Um, so by the time the First World War, by the time the pandemic in, in 1918 was really underway, the question was, all right then, we all know about this because of FIFA, let's isolate this bacillus. But then bacteriologists around the world found they were not always isolating it. Hmm. They were some, sometimes isolating it, but it was overwhelmingly not FIFA's bacillus, but a gram-positive organism called Streptococcus and another one called Staphylococcus. And these people were dying, moreover, of streptococcal and staphylococcal superinfection. Now, the, today, people coming into my hospital mainly in the young group and the elderly group, coming in with what's called community-acquired pneumonia. Mm -hmm. Like already the, by today, 10 of them would have come to the Royal London probably. Yeah. Uh, mostly, mostly elderly, especially at the beginning of the, of the respiratory season. Uh, and it would be pneumonia. And the doctors would know what it would be, because flu hasn't yet arrived. They say, right, it's a bacterium, it's streptococcus, pneumococcus. Give them a dose of penicillin, put them on the side ward, and they will be fine. Yeah. And usually they are, but very occasionally, even today, they do all this, and what happens is they're not fine, they're on the side wall, they're not, react, they're not responding to the penicillin, and what's more, one of the nurses has gone now with, with, with something that looks like flu. So suddenly everyone cottons on that this person with this pneumonia has got influenza pneumonia. So uh, even today, we recognize that people who get influenza most people re recover from it quite well. 
Um, but those who do not recover from it, in the end, they might, they could die of the virus itself, but they're more just as likely to die of a super infection with a bacterium. Right. So that was described, they began to realize that in, in the First World War, in the 1918 pandemic, and we, it's still the case today. It's still the case today. Yeah, if you're looking for indicators, um, uh, then I think it's a very good indicator. There's two of them. Uh, one is the youth, youth, and one is cyanosis. So if anyone comes to me from the literature, um, and particularly what comes to me, who comes to me from the literature is an American doctor working out in Kansas, mm -hmm. some well-begotten spot. And in 1918, he writes a single little line to the Center for Disease Control saying, ah, I've got some cases of serious influenza in my general practice, you see. That is it. That is his scientific paper. Mm -hmm. And the Americans particularly, Cros Crosby to his shame, uh, have put this chap forward as finding the first out the first example of the outbreak in right. 1918. The so-called American theory. The American theory. Yeah. And it has, I'm, fair enough, I'm criticizing it, but it has been criticized more, more recently by the Americans than one group in America itself. Mm -hmm. And the criticism is that we don't believe it because uh, we've got no evidence, and he's not presented any evidence, that the two features of the 1918 differing from any other pandemic is that it attacked young people. Now, if Dr. Minor Lauren Reiner from Kansas, or yeah. those were, had said on this, this single line, it is very unusual because it's killing not my elderly patients, but my younger ones. And not only that, these younger ones had this bluing of the face, yeah. then we'd all believe it. Yeah. But until we see that, and of course it's too late now, yeah. we don't believe it. I don't, certainly don't believe it. So those were features, yes, of this pandemic. That, but not all of them. Not every soldier, not every person who died ended up with this blue face, with this blue face. But it was used, it was often enough, and it was used by a ward sister or a junior doctor. Mm -hmm. They could come into the ward, they could look down the ward that morning and say, look, patient in bed 5, 8, 13, they've got the cyanosis. They're not going to last tonight. So we can get other people into their beds tomorrow. So it was used like that. Um, but I suspect a lot of people in the community, and, and this is where we have to be very careful about all these descriptions, they're mainly in the descriptions from 1918 flu, they're often by medical, by doctors in the army, because mm -hmm. that, was, that was where most of the soldiers yeah. in Europe, most young people were, yeah. especially men. Um, I'm not so sure that this was happening in the community, Interesting. where most people died. Most people died at home. Yeah. And I think if they'd been dying at home with a lavender coloration and blue lips i think their relatives would have been terrified yeah. and i don't think also there was so much blood around there's also there's all these descriptions in the army of, of bleeding no, nosebleeds and things i don't think that was so common in the community because i think we would have heard about that as well yeah. Yeah. so i think most people who died died at home we would have i think died fairly quietly um, died gasping for breath. Yeah. Um, but it's not the worst way to die, I guess. And they died in their beds. The nearest we get to it. You see, there's a lot of descriptive stuff coming from newspapers mm -hmm. saying that people are walking out in the street one minute and dying and being carried in, in on, on the last legs from the street. Well, uh, I don't think that sort of thing tells us all that much. And it's probably been highly exaggerated. And so there has been this exaggeration, um, I come across it myself, that everyone dies. Yeah. You know, from the way that you begin that, and that, I say to my students, that most people survived. Yeah. You know, 99.5% of people in the community survived. Yeah. Um, so it, with this virus roared into, a, I think you can put it, say, roaring into a community, like into London or England or Canada, mm -hmm. most people survived it. Mm -hmm. That's not to say that most people survived it perfectly healthy. Yes. Uh, it's like the war, isn't it? You, you, and I th often think we should enumerate our, the, the, the consequences of this outbreak, this flu outbreak, like they do in war. Again and again, we read of casualties. 
um, you know, what were the casualties when the Canadians stormed across in the last hundred days? Yeah. The casualties are normally written like 50,000 casualties, but that means 10,000 dead mm -hmm. and 40,000 wounded and so many missing and so many taken prison. So I think we should uh, take that example with this virus because for every person who ended up dying of pneumonia and heliocyanosis and all this and that, there probably were another five or ten who, or at least, let's say five, that would be fairly accurate, who were seriously ill, who ended up in hospital, who almost died. Now, you're not going to be well again if you got to the edge uh, and with pneumonia and almost died, but they pulled you back. Mm -hmm. You probably would never be the same person again. Yeah. Never, ever, ever. So it's quite likely you're crippled for the rest of your life. Yes. So I, th I would rather treat, to put it in proper perspective, this virus, um, I'd rather bring the casualties in and then we appreciate that this virus, this influenza A virus, is a billion casualty virus mm -hmm. and that makes us wake up. Yeah. It really does make us wake up. Yeah. Bring in all the casualties, bring in the, the epidemics in the last hundred years and we're talking about a, vi a virus that can, with, with billion casualties and then we think, well, why haven't we done more about it? this billion casualty. HIV doesn't give you a billion casualties. Hep B doesn't give you it, but influenza does. And I think we've not taken it seriously enough. It's the, it's the memory mm -hmm. of it. And I think the memory has, is faulty. The memory, the impact. And probably because we've concentrated too much on death. And I understand why, if you're a statistician or even a virologist, it's a very, it looks like a very concrete endpoint, mm -hmm. death. Um, and so the figures look accurate. But many people were wounded by that virus. Yeah. And that, in its aggregate, the fact that they then spend the le rest of their life struggling along, um, I think we should recognize. I and mean, we don't even recognize it with the First World War. Yeah. Because I know what happened in the First World War. Um, with, from, from one narrow aspect, the medical aspect particularly, people came back, my father came back, um, but sometimes, my father was okay, but sometimes they, didn't, they never recovered. Yes. They walked home, they came by train, they came home to their mothers, mm -hmm. but they were never right, they were never right. Yeah. Um, uh, and that's not made enough of. We all know about heroes putting out Whereas most of my father said no one was a hero. Yeah. You just sat there. You were, you were, you were ca cannon fodder. You just sat there until some shell burst killed you or tore your arms off or something terrible. So there's not, there was nothing heroic about it, actually. So we, we must get out of that way of thinking straight away. <laughs>
and general care. And then they spent the rest of their lives perhaps suffering from that. So how are you going to commemorate that? How are you going to do it? Well, I think we've put not enough attention uh, on what happened at home. Uh, and I've had a number of people uh, write to me. I've got some historians dotted around the country <laughs> who are terrifically helpful, and they, they're local historians, and they go out and they, they get letters. They've collected letters. Um, and I've, I've been reading some of those recently. Um, and then you can try and explore what has been happening. And from my exploration, people didn't realize they were going to die until they died. Yeah. And I've looked at a series of letters from a, a young woman, a 21-year-old in Wales, in a small village in Wales. And she was writing to her mother every day. And uh, I don't really understand why her mother wasn't there. She was there with her father and the mother was a few miles away. They could get two deliveries of mail a day mm. in 1918. And she could write to her mother, and she did write to her mother about how, how the dad is and how things are. But it's, they, do, they are not letters from someone who's about to die. They really aren't. And I don't think she wrote them to allay worry to her mother. I think they, they're letters that, I mean, she's saying that her dad's not too well, but now he's gonna be, she's going to write, and she hopes her mother's all right, and the mother hopes she's all right. The letters are coming backwards and forwards, and then suddenly they stop because she's dead. Um, and the last letter she wrote, she said it was a bit strange. She had this very strange dream last night, um, all blue light, and, and Dad said, Dad came in and woke me up and said, are you all right? You're yelling out things. And she said, it's very strange, never had that sort of, what do you think that means, Mum? But the next day she's dead. So, you see, I think they're, 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 they don't realise how ill they are. And I, I suspect that would have, could have happened more often than we think. And I think most people died in those, in at home. And it would have been not a particularly bad experience when you come to think of it, but a lot of it. And then the rest of the family looking around and asking what happened. Yeah. And that's what they're still asking what happened. Yeah. I mean, I went to the, the Royal College of Nurses. I've got their headquarters down at the bottom of Harley Street. Mm. And they have an exhibition about 1918, mm -hmm. nursing. And I expected something huge, but it's a room about like half the size of this room. That is it, yeah. you see. And I was surprised and rather shocked at that. I'm not making a critical remark about them in a way, but you could say, why don't they, why don't they trumpet it from the, from the top of the building? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and so on. So uh, I, I still don't understand why we haven't um, grasped it in its enormity. When we opened our pandemic window, which is the first, and probably the only big memorial, the only memorial I so the, the yeah. Goga is, is Goga, yeah. it's all Goga. Where have we come from? Who are we? And where are we going? Yes. Um, so it's a, I think it's a wonderful memorial, quiet. It's quiet, all right, but, but wonderful. When we opened it, on the day we say opened the window, um, uh, we had the Archbishop of London, who, Dr. St. Am, who was now the Bishop of York, mm -hmm. Archbishop of York. It gave us opened it as a service. We had the great hymns. Um, we had the organ playing for the first time. Um, we had four wire artists, dancers, who came down from the top of the church on stainless thin stainless steel wires, and they commemorated it in in um, in dressed in black first of all with masks on, swinging round on the thing, uh, and then. After all the service and the, everything else, the final thing was uh, a, 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 a single dance that came down from the other end of the church, dressed in white, mm. and unraveled from her a great white sheet of silk that mm. came down. Mm. So there were the two aspects of it, the recovery and the opening new world, and the, the, the versus the infection and what went on in the first two. So that's, that's the memorial that we have but I was quite surprised at the time it didn't, it didn't elicit more interest. Mm. I think we had one television group there looking at it. I was slightly disappointed that it wasn't more um, impactful. So I don't know how we will deal with all this as we go on from this commemoration. I hope something will come. There's a lot of scientific meetings going on. Yeah. So maybe that will um, stimulate more science. And if that science ends up with a discovery, 
uh, if, that, if that discovery is to do with a virus other than flu or specifically to do with the flu, I would find that most pleasing. That would be a, a, a memorial. That, that would be a memorial, yeah. a fitting memorial that we all want. I mean, it's like, like this year, we might eradicate, all of us might eradicate polio. Yeah. And, you know, that, that would be so fitting um, to get rid of a virus that polio. As we've already done as the virological team of the world, eradicating smallpox. Yes. Number one, smallpox. Number two, polio. Number three could be measles. And we have it on our sites, yeah. one, off, one after the other. Flu has seemed impossible. It seems impossible to eradicate because it has an animal bird reservoir. Mm -hmm. So you can't. You have to kill all the migrating <laughs> birds off. Um, but you can ameliorate it. You can make people safe by if we could get more effective vaccines and new antiviral drugs. This year there is a new antiviral drug appearing um, called Baloxavir, I think, uh, affecting the replication of the virus here. So that's another step forward. But I think we need more than that so maybe the focus of all these scientific meetings will from that focus from that thing some idea someone will say, and it only needs one person somewhere in the world to say i've, I've got it i know what we need to do and get on it this, uh, this i would want students and their parents and their grandparents um, to take note of infectious disease which is, after all, a chain reaction. It's a chain reaction. You start with one, you end, you, that one infects three, those three infect nine, those nine infect 27, and within, within 40 days, you've got a million people infected. Mm. It's a chain reaction with these viruses. Exponential. Exponential chain reaction. Take it more seriously. Um, think of breaking the, this chain of infection, which you can do by vaccines, by new drugs, discovery, um, or by hygiene, take it internationally, because no good just fighting the infections in your garden, in your back garden, when a thousand miles away someone else has got a back garden in trouble, and they could arrive on the next Pan Am flight <laughs> in the afternoon. It's, it, there was a poet, Elizabeth I had a poet, my favourite poet was John Donne, mm. and John Donne wrote the poem, No Man is an Island, for whom the bell tolls. I always think of him because he was a preacher near my hospital at Barnes. I come out and look at St Paul's, and that's where he, and this is a concept that people have not grasped yeah. today. Remind that is, we're all in this together. That's right. We are all in this together and we all have to help each other. Zika may not come for special reasons. Ebola may not come here uh, for, for the reasons that only that virus knows and we don't know. But other viruses do and will come here. Um, so it, the, 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 the whole thing's very international. You have to think internationally and you have to think seriously. And there's too much thinking about people who've got no knowledge of it and, and just pick up a bit of information and go from there. And there's too many people who think the earth is flat. I mean, seriously, yes. there's too many people who think that the world began 8,000 years ago. And there are too many people who don't like this and don't like that and don't like vaccines. Yeah. So in other words, there's a growing anti-science feeling yeah, um, and, and, and skeptics. And the worst of it was, I went to um, Edinburgh recently, where one of my daughters is living, who's, who's a young doctor there. I went to the museum and the art gallery, and there was a huge painting called The, the Four Professors. And these characters were in their white gowns, <laughs> and they were skulking. They were like, they were like looking over their shoulder. They'd, they'd been caught doing something they shouldn't have been doing. And there were the professors of physiology, medicine, biochemistry, and surgery, I think. And I thought, what, what, why are they painted like that? Why have you painted scientists and people like that? And I think it's an anti-science painting, to be frank about it. Okay. So I think you, yeah, it yeah. creeps into the society, yeah. Yeah. this anti-science, and don't believe this and don't believe that. So I would say to your students and my students, that's the, been the, one of the greatest things to keep your feet on the ground in a world that uh, will depend on science. Yeah. We're all going to depend on science. We're not going to get out of these infection issues just by, just by waving our hands. It's got to be all, all scientific, but there's an increasing minority of people who are very antagonistic, and that has to be changed in some sort of way. Maybe we're not persuading them properly. Maybe we're not communicating 
um, the wonder of science um, to them. Yes, we, we all need something to keep us going. Yeah. Whatever you're doing, um, you need some, the driving thing to keep you going. And uh, Jeffrey Tellenberger put it to me one day about this driving, this interconnection as well, that it's like a relay race. Mm. Science is like, can be like anything else, but the relay race, a generation before you passes on something yeah. and you don't gobble it all up, what you have to do is pass it on to the next generation as well. So there's a somewhat a relay race about all this. From these failing hands, we pass the torch. Yes, yes. yes. Um, but on top of that, I think you need something more uh, to appeal to you, person on top on top of that to keep going. I mean, how did he keep going for nine years, waking up every morning, wondering if he had a positive sample or not, you see? Um, with me, I think I have been inspired, not by Mark Sykes himself, though I, I do find him inspiring, but his family uh, and the family of Phyllis Burns, yes. you see, and the family of Mrs. Halliday, yes. soon, the family of the coal miners in Spitsbergen. So that all these years later, in a virus that's been called the forgotten pandemic, <laughs> you find very much they have not forgotten. No. <laughs> and um, and they, not only have they not forgotten, but when you say to them, could we exhume your relative? And if you're Catholic, I think particularly, that's not a very good sign to yeah. start saying that. Yeah. Um, they, they have, we have not asked anyone and got a refusal. Um, I mean, I think with Sir Mark Sykes' family, I think 13 members of the family agree to it, yeah. to have the exhumation. With Phyllis, um, they said, they only had one picture of Phyllis uh, Burns, and she was a VAD, mm -hmm. um, went to the Western Front. I think she was at the Tapler, where yes, we, we've been all the rest, and then, and then came back. She came back to the great railway stations in London and was not feeling well, mm -hmm. tightening was across the chest, She'd nursed soldiers who died of influenza. She knew what she had. And she didn't go home. She sat it out in a little flat to protect her mother. Yeah, she now, didn't her, even go to see her mother. No, right? yeah. no. So, and the family and the, the relative I spoke to gave permission. Um, she said, look, if Phyllis were here, they only had the picture this big, big time. She said, if Phyllis were here in this room now, she would say yes. Now, how about that? So that is pretty in, in, inspiring. Um, with Mark Sykes, um, I did feel with him that he had helped. He was one of these people who did not, they didn't run for it, you see. You could run for it, you could. You could say, well, I've, I've, I've had enough of all this. Yeah. And I, I remember in the SARS outbreak, of, uh, a doctor from Hong Kong, when the outbreak started, phoned me up and gave me a right telling off. She said, I've heard you on the radio saying about all this. She said, you don't, you don't realize what it's like. She said, I'm an anesthetist. I did not sign up to get myself killed with a SARS virus. So I'm not going to go in. I'm going to stay at home. So you can take that attitude. There was a chap recently, what, well, Deputy Director of Police or something, Metropolitan Police. While a policeman was being stabbed to death in front of him outside the house of he sat in his car. Yeah. Now, you, now, we don't know, and this is what the Gauguin painting is all about, we don't know what our reaction is going to be. I don't know what my reaction is going to be, and nor do you. Yeah. We just hope it will be a good reaction. Yeah. And with these, these people like Mark Sykes, Phyllis Burns, Mrs. Halliday, we know that their, their reactions were good. Yes. You know, faced with it, they did their best and died. Mark Sykes helped his wife. He could have, you know, a lord. He could have got 20 doctors and 100 nurses, but he didn't. He tried to do his best himself and caught the virus and that killed him. So I think all those things are particularly inspiring. Most of all, I think I, I personally am inspired by the relatives who in this day, living relatives, want to know scientifically what happened to their relative of 100 years ago. They want to know, they're interested to know. And I think that pushes me along.